All right. So, sorry we, sorry I had to cancel uh, two lectures because I was ill. Um, what I suggest we do, and hopefully it's gonna work out, is that first of all, we're gonna combine two lectures into one, which is this lecture. So we're gonna be talking about chemical reactions in metabolism and coenzymes in, it was planned to be in two lectures, but I've reworked the, ma the material and I think we can fit 98% of it into one lecture, okay? So that's what we're gonna do today. It's gonna be relatively quick, okay? But there's gonna be a recording, so you can go through it later on if you want to. And basically all of the material that we're going to, co <coughs> that we're going to cover today, we will go through once again, once we look at all the, uh, all the uh, metabolic pathways, we will look at the reactions again and you will see them in, in context, okay? So don't worry, don't be too frustrated if this is gonna be a lot, okay, and relatively quick. Okay, because we will see it again. Uh, and then the, the lecture on enzymes and kinetics and enzyme inhibition, I suggest we meet sometime next week because this week is extremely full, okay? Uh, but I will find a, a time next week where you have free, okay, in the schedule. I will email you about it and you can let me know some feedback if, if that's gonna work and we will have specifically this lecture, okay? Again, it will be recorded, so you know, if you can't make it, there will be a recording, okay? But it'd be nice if at least somebody turned up, okay? Because otherwise it's quite difficult to lecture to an empty room. Um, okay, so I will email you about that, but it's not going to be this week because that would kill me, okay? And maybe you as well, I don't know. Um, right, so, um, in the lecture that we didn't have, <laughs> on enzymes, we would have talked about the fact that enzymes, many enzymes, uh, need for the catalytic activity, for being able to catalyze a reaction, uh, they need a non-protein component. So enzymes are proteins, but some of them need some component which is not a protein, okay? And we usually call these non-protein components cofactors or coenzymes. Okay, both names are used depending on the, the literature or the author, okay? So cofactors or, co or coenzymes. Um, these cofactors or coenzymes can have different forms. Can you shut the door behind you? Thanks. Uh, they can have different forms or rather they can have different relationships with the enzyme and with the reaction, okay? We do have coenzymes or cofactors which are permanently bound into the enzyme, okay? It could be a covalent bond, it could be non-covalent bond, but they are so strongly bound to the enzyme that they never leave the enzyme, okay? And these types of cofactors we usually call prosthetic groups. Okay, so coenzymes that are bound to the enzyme are called often in literature prosthetic groups, okay? You, mu you may find them called just coenzymes, but be aware that this is a specific term for those coenzymes or cofactors which are strongly bound into the enzyme. The other type of coenzyme, which is also called coenzyme, is actually a co-substrate. A co-substrate, what does it mean? Well, we still call it a coenzyme because it's a non-protein part of the reaction, but really what this co-substrate does is it comes into the reaction, either brings something or takes something away from the reaction. So it really is, in fact, it really is a co-substrate, it's just another substrate of the reaction. But you will find them called coenzymes because some of these co-substrates appear in many different reactions. Okay, so they are so commonly found with enzymes that they started to be called coenzymes. Historically, remember when we talked about the discovery of uh, metabolism, we said that they discovered first something called zymase, and then they found that there was something that was soluble, and apart from it, and they call it cozymase. So these coenzymes, these type of coenzymes, are called, for historical reasons, they are still called coenzymes, 
but really, and we'll see them many, many times in reactions, we will uh, see them as co-substrates. Okay? So these, this is the, the basic two division of coenzymes. Okay? The last group, which doesn't neatly fit into this, are metal ions. Okay? Ions of metals, which we find in various, uh, in various uh, enzymes. And sometimes they are part of a prosthetic group, sometimes they are just as metal cofactors present in the enzyme, okay? So this is just a little bit of terminology. It's not as clear cut, this terminology, as it seems, okay? Most people just say coenzymes and they mean any of those things, okay? So this is just, if you see any of these, uh, of these terms, just be aware that this is what they mean. Uh, right. So today I will mention quite a few of coenzymes, uh, both the metal ions and organic compounds, which are, as I said, uh, important for the, or necessary for the function of many enzymes. But we will see them in context. So the structure of the lecture is going to be built around chemical reactions, types of chemical reactions. With each chemical reaction or group of chemical reactions, we will mention, we'll talk about what kind of enzymes, which class of enzymes or what type of enzymes uh, catalyze this reaction. And then we'll talk about which coenzymes are likely to be found in this specific reaction, okay? So we will be talking in abstract, so we'll be talking about oxidation and decarboxylation, et cetera. But of course, once we start looking at, uh, at the specific metabolic pathways, we will see these as actual reactions, and you will say, ah, oh, okay, this is a decarboxylation, therefore it is catalyzed by decarboxylase, and therefore it probably contains this and this coenzymes. That's the goal for this lecture. But as I said, it's gonna be a lot, so don't worry if you don't pick everything in one go. Right. Um, the first reaction that we see in metabolism everywhere all the time, but it's a reaction which doesn't really require enzymes, is dissociation, okay? So an acid or a base or a salt can dissociate, therefore form ions, right? So an acid will deprotonate, a base could protonate, for example, well, that's not dissociation really, that's a protonation. But dissociation is just a, so you dissolve something with an ionic bond and it splits up and forms some ions, okay? So that's a reaction that occurs all the time in our metabolism, but it's not really interesting enough for us to talk about it anymore, okay? So just be aware that it exists. It exists as dissociation. The first real group of reactions that we'll look, uh, look at in quite some detail are oxidations and reductions. It's not dry sponge, but yeah, we'll have to do. So this is oxidations and reductions. Reduction. Now, what is, what is oxidation and what is reduction? What, what is the, the principle behind it? What actually goes on if we oxidize or reduce them? Hmm? Correct, so oxidation and reduction is really just a transfer of electrons from something to something else, okay? This from something to something else is important. So if we oxidize something, something else has to be reduced. The electrons have to go somewhere, they can't disappear, okay? So we're just moving them from one thing to another. Now, oxidation is gaining electrons or it's loss of electrons, okay? Reduction is gaining electrons, okay? Accepting electrons. This is something that you've probably mostly seen before. So. There are many, many, many reactions in metabolism which involve oxidation and reduction, and most of these are catalyzed by a, by a big group of, actually the whole class of enzymes, which is called oxidoreductases. So the enzymes are called oxidoreductases. Oxidoreductase. And oxidoreductases form a whole class of enzymes which is the first class of enzymes. This is enzyme classification, okay, and there are seven different classes. This is something that we would have covered in the enzyme lecture, okay, and we will cover it uh, next week. But there are seven classes, seven EC classes, uh, and you have it in your uh, workbooks and everywhere, okay, so you can, you can have a, a look at it there. Um, so there are seven classes, and one of them are oxidoreductases, okay, so it's a whole class of enzymes. Now, what, 
types of reductions and oxidations can we find in metabolism? A very common oxidation, potentially if we're going the other way, reduction reaction is the oxidation of an alcohol, of an OH group, to a keto group or an aldehyde, to a ketone or aldehyde. Okay? So we can have some kind of a alcohol which is oxidized to, in this case, an aldehyde. Okay? And this oxidation means that two electrons have to be moved to something else. Okay? We said, we said that oxidation reduction is moving electrons around. So we have to take these two electrons and put them onto something else. Okay? I'll come in a second to, to, to what we actually uh, put them on. Um, this sequence can continue and this aldehyde can be further oxidized to carboxylic acid. Okay. And once again, two electrons are removed from, from the donor, which in this case is, al is an aldehyde. Okay. So this sequence is something that we see all the time in met metabolism. Okay. We'll be seeing many reactions where an alcohol is reduced to an aldehyde or a ketone, for example, and where aldehydes are further oxidized to carboxylic acid. Ketones can't really be, or not easily, or not without breaking the molecule, can really be oxidized further, okay? Just one second. Um, so this is something that we will be seeing quite a lot. Yeah. They're all with the same enzyme? No. No, so all these enzymes, or both of these enzymes, will be part of this class of oxidoreductases, okay? But usually these ones would be called alcohol dehydrogenases, and these would be aldehyde dehydrogenases. But don't worry about the specific names of enzymes, because we'll be covering that once we see the, the actual metabolic pathways, okay? Oh, this is just an overview. It's not specific, it's specific aldehyde, not carbonyl. You, you told before the uh, ketone, so. It's so, if it's a secondary alcohol, yeah. it will produce a ketone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a ketone can't easily be further, I mean, can be further oxidized, but then the molecule is broken down. So here I'm showing an aldehyde because aldehyde can be easily oxidized to a carboxylic acid. Does that, was that yeah. your question? I asked you because you, you, you told the enzyme it's a aldehyde, aldehyde. No, the first one would be alcohol dehydrogenase. The other one would be aldehyde dehydrogenase in this case. Okay. But again, don't worry about the specific names of enzymes. We'll see them in metabolic pathways. This is just to show that all these are oxidoreductases, okay? And all of them take electrons from alcohols or aldehydes to produce these products, okay? A third possibility of uh, an oxidation that we'll see many times in metabolism is taking a single bone, a single carbon-carbon bone, and oxidizing it to a double bond. Once again, two electrons are removed, and we get a double bond. It could be called a desaturase, okay? There are also different names for these enzymes. That's why I'm saying the specific names of enzymes are tricky. They are different for different enzymes, okay? But they're all oxidoreductases, and the type of reaction is oxidation, okay? It could be desaturase, yes. Now, where do these electrons end up? And this is where we come to the class of coenzymes called usually co-substrates, okay? So we do have these redox coenzymes, And these redox coenzymes are usually carriers of electrons. So they're molecules that can be reduced because if they accept electrons, they themselves are reduced. And they carry these electrons and can put them or use them in some other reaction. Okay? So these electrons don't just stay in the air, but they are bound to redox coenzymes. What kind of redox co coenzymes we, uh, will we be seeing? Uh, the, one of the most common ones and that is indeed a co-substrate, as we'll see in a second, 
is a redox pair of NAD plus NADH. We'll, we'll get to that, okay? So it's NAD plus to NADH. You know that the name is quite complicated. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Uh, the complication in, in the name, I mean, depends. People have different reasons why, for why it's complicated. But what is this nucleotide thing there? Nucleotide, as we'll discuss later on, but you've seen it already or you've heard it already, is a compound containing what? A nucleotide. Hmm? Okay, so it contains a base, some kind of a base. Then it contains a sugar, ribose, and then a phosphate. Okay, so a general construction of a nucleotide is a base, sugar, and a phosphate. And indeed, NAD plus contains two bases, two sugars, and a phosphate. So it looks like it's two nucleotides connected together. That's why there is this weird name, okay? Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Hmm? No, there are, I mean, it's one molecule, but it contains two nucleotides. One base is this nicotinamide, and the other base is the adenine. And then there are the sugars and phosphate. Two sugars? Yep. <laughs> yeah. No one will ask you to know the structure of NAD+. Plus. Don't worry about it, okay? I'm just explaining why it has this weird name. Yes? Don't worry about it. It is really, <laughs> you're never gonna be tested on that, okay? So don't worry about the structure of it. I'm just trying to explain why it, why is it called dinucleotide, right? So, the conversion why is everyone so <laughs> interested in the structure? I mean, that's great, but it's more important that you know the amino acids, for example, okay? And don't worry about, it. Don't worry about NADH. Uh, the conversion of NAD plus to NADH requires two electrons. But as you can see, in order to make this thing work, we, we need also to bring a proton. Okay, so in effect, what NAD plus takes is a hydride anion. It's a proton plus two electrons. But this is, again, something you don't need to worry about. The important thing is that it's taking two electrons. Oxidation and reduction is all about electrons. Those protons are just round, okay? They're boring. Protons are boring. Don't worry about them, okay? The interesting thing are electrons. Good, so that's NAD plus NADH, and as I stressed before, NAD plus NADH is a co-substrate. It comes to the reaction the same way as, for example, this alcohol, okay? And the electrons from the alcohol go onto NADH, NAD plus to form NADH, and then NADH just leaves the enzyme and can go to some other reaction. It's a pure co-substrate. Still call them coenzymes, but it's just a pure another substrate, okay? We'll see in a second that that's not the case for all of them. Uh, a very close twin of NAD plus NADH is NADP plus NADPH. The only difference is a P because there's another phosphate there. Everything else works exactly the same. It's a co-substrate, it takes two electrons to turn from an ADP plus to an ADP pH, okay? Everything is the same, the only difference is one phosphate, chemically speaking, okay? Functionally, those two co-substrates, coenzymes, are completely separate in our metabolism, in our cells, okay? So reactions that, that use NAD plus and NADH are kept separate from reactions that use NADP plus and NADPH. And a rule of thumb, which you can use to know which one is which, 
is that NAD plus is usually used in catabolic reactions, in reactions where we are breaking down molecules and producing ATP. NADP plus, NADPH, is used for synthetic reactions when we are building something, okay? And the important thing is that the cell is keeping those two pools of reduced equivalents or reducing coenzymes or whatever separate. There's one place in mitochondria, an enzyme called transhydro uh, transhydrogenase, which can move electrons between NAD plus and NADP. It's probably better to forget about it that it exists, okay? Keep in your head, those are separate pools, okay? They, the streams never cross, okay? They do, but, huh? Uh, apart from the phosphate group, okay, which gives it a different name, is that these are used in catabolic reactions and these are used in anabolic reactions. As a rule of thumb, it's not always the case, but it's almost always the case, okay? Almost. So, these are the two redox coenzymes or co-substrates that we'll be using quite a lot. Now, the next one looks similar on the first side, but it, it couldn't be more different. Well, it could be more different, but it is quite different. And that is FAD. It's all redox, it's all oxidoreduction. Okay, I'll tell you when we, when we get to the next one. Okay. No. Let me, let me first say at least one sentence and you'll see in a second, okay, that they are not the same thing. Okay, so FAD to FADH, just notice there is no plus there, okay. Uh, it's flavine adenine dinucleotide, okay. That's again dinucleotide because there are two sugars, phosphate, uh, two bases. Here it's a bit tricky because one of those sugars is not a really sugar, a real sugar, so some people are saying it shouldn't be a dinucleotide because the one sugar is actually alcohol, but whatever. It's still called this. That's not the biggest problem with this or biggest difference. Once again, the reduction requires two electrons. But the biggest difference of these flavine-based nucleotides, so flavine-based redox coenzymes, and the nicotinamide-based coenzymes is that these are not co-substrates. They don't really come and go, but they are almost all, I mean, they're always part of the, protein, or of the protein, of the enzyme, or some other protein, okay? So NAD plus is freely flowing around in the cytoplasm, okay? Not really so freely, because remember we said how thick the environment is, uh, but it is free, it, it is not part of an enzyme. FAD is always, always, always hidden inside the enzyme or some other carrier protein. It's never free. So these are not co-substrates. These are proper prosthetic groups, generally. Okay, so they are covalently attached to the enzyme. I will repeat it again once we get to situations where this could be confusing, okay? Just be aware that when you, when you see in a textbook, because that's a common mistake in textbooks and everywhere, okay? When you see that some enzyme is reoxidizing F8, sorry, FADH2, <laughs> should have been FADH2. Uh, if you see that an enzyme is reoxidizing FADH2, it's almost definitely not true. Okay? If you see in a textbook that some enzyme is reoxidizing FADH2, it's not true because there is no free FADH2. Okay, it's always hidden inside an enzyme. I will say it again once we get to the specific situation where this happens, okay? So be aware that if an enzyme says, so if a textbook says NADH comes and gives off electrons, that's fine, that is what happens, okay? If it says FADH2 comes and gives off electrons, that's definitely not true, okay? It's, n it's never free. Um, FAD also has a, not a twin, but a cousin maybe, called FMN, which stands for flavin mononucleotide. Again, it's probably not a nucleotide because there's no sugar, but only uh, an alcohol. But that's what it's called, flavin mononucleotide. And again, it is a redox prosthetic group. It's always hidden inside enzymes, and we'll see some enzymes that contain FMN, okay? So these molecules also accept electrons or give electrons, but always as a part of an enzyme never just uh, coming and going. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
No, it doesn't. Huh, okay. We'll see specific examples of that, okay? Actually, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, okay? So I, I will highlight it again, and, and I think it's gonna be clear what, what this means. Good. Um, so we'll be seeing these coenzymes quite a lot in metabolism. Oh, sorry, you had a question. No, you didn't have a question. We already answered it. Okay, yeah. Uh, It's a prosthetic group. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll be seeing these quite a lot, but there are other coenzymes that we can find in oxidoreductases that I will just mention, that I will just tell you about, because we will see them in more specific reactions in metabolism, not as commonly as these ones, but we will still see them. Uh, one redox coenzyme that we already came across, but probably people won't remember it, uh, is called tetrahydrobiopterin. Yeah, it's a mouthful of THB. Does anyone recall where we saw this coenzyme? Tetrahydrobiopterin. Huh? In? In what? It's not an enzyme, it's a coenzyme. Okay, biopterin. It's a coenzyme, okay? We saw this coenzyme very briefly in the very first lecture of this whole course when we talked about phenylketonuria. And we said that the, the enzyme that converts phenylalanine to tyrosine contains this coenzyme, okay? And we will see it in, in a few more reactions. It's not super common, but it's relatively common. So just be aware that THB, tetrahydrobiopterin, is another coenzyme which is often found, a prosthetic group actually, which is found in many enzymes. Hydrolase enzyme, no? Hmm? Hydrolase enzyme. We are still with oxidoreductases. Tetrahydrobiopterin. Tetrahydrobiopterin. Hmm? Pterin. There is PT next to each other. Pterin. Yeah? Okay, we're still with oxidoreductases, no hydrolases yet. Uh, okay, so the EC1 class is the redox coenzyme. No, EC1 class are oxidoreductases. It's a class of enzymes. Yes. And these enzymes have redox coenzymes such as NAD+. These enzymes, yeah. okay. 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 Good. No. No, it's a coenzyme. It's part of the enzyme. Okay. Um, another common, very common coenzyme of oxidoreductases is heme. It's heme. And heme, as you all know, contains inside the molecule uh, an ion of a metal, which is, uh, the name of the metal is iron, yeah? Okay, so it contains iron, and you said correctly, well, you suggested correctly that the common redox forms of iron are iron two plus, iron three plus, ferrous and ferric, and this is indeed the mechanism through which any compounds containing iron, it could be heme or it could be some other forms of iron, can be also carriers of electrons, okay? If we take iron three plus, it can take up one electron, turn to iron two plus, and then it, go, it can go somewhere else and give this electron to something other, okay? So in this, in this uh, way, iron in various forms can work similarly to uh, these other redox coenzymes, okay? takes electrons and puts them somewhere else. The difference being is that here we had two electrons and here it's just one electron, okay? This iron can only carry one electron. We do have situations in our cells, in our metabolism, where iron can go all the way to four plus, okay? Uh, which is very unusual in chemistry. It happens in some enzymes, but we're not, we're not going to 
talk about it very much because yeah, it's a very exotic way of, uh, it's a very exotic state of iron, so don't worry about it. But heme is a very common form of iron that we find in oxidoreductases. Correct. If it's Fe3+, plus, if we add an electron, it turns to Fe2+. Plus. And this can give off an electron and turn to 3+. Plus. Um, I'm not sure. So it has three positive charges, and if you add an electron, which is a negative charge, it only has two positive charges then. Okay. Correct. With one electron. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so heme, a very common form of iron, but we also have other kinds, other forms of iron that we find not as commonly as heme. Heme is super common in oxidoreductases. But the other forms are, for example, so-called FES clusters, or iron sulfur clusters. Iron sulfur clusters. And if you recall, when we talked about the origins of metabolism, how metabolism started, we said that one of the theories, one of the hypotheses was that maybe ferrous sulfide, the mineral, may have been the substrate on which the first metabolic pathway started. And we still carry with us in some of our enzymes kind of bits of this, of this ferrous sulfide, of this mineral, in crystalline, quasi-crystalline form. So these are the iron sulfur clusters, and we'll see them again in two days' time uh, as part of the respiratory chain as, a, as an important pathway. Okay? So FES clusters, another form of iron. And again, iron can switch between 2 plus and 3 plus and therefore accept or give off electrons. That's what makes it into a redox carrier. The uh, last two redox coenzymes that I want you to know, cofactors in this case, is another transition metal, which is copper, because copper can again change between copper one and copper two, okay, by accepting or giving off one electron, same way as iron. And we will see again some enzymes. It's not as common as iron, but it is present in enzymes, and we'll see some enzymes that contain copper. Um, and the last carrier of electrons, coenzyme, uh, that I'll mention now, and again, we'll see it in two days' time, is ubiquinone, or coenzyme Q, which may be the more, common, more commonly known name. Coenzyme Q, or coenzyme Q10, or ubiquinone, that's the same thing. Ubiquinone, or coenzyme Q, which is a carrier of electrons in, the, in mitochondria, and we'll talk about it in two days' time in the respiratory chain. Again, it takes two electrons to reduce itself, and then gives off these two electrons uh, to somewhere else. So that's the general principle of redox coenzymes, is that they can reduce themselves, and then give the electrons to something else. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The FES is kind of co-substrate or it's... It's a prosthetic group. It's a prosthetic group. Yeah. It's not leaving the enzyme. It's actually structural. It's structural part of the enzyme. On the iron, right? Huh? On the iron side. Uh, yes. I mean, heme is prosthetic group. Yeah, absolutely. FES, absolutely. THB, copper as well. It's not leaving the enzyme at all. Ubiquinone is pretty much a co-substrate comes and goes. So what is the difference between prosthetic groups and metal ions? Yeah, I mean, prosthetic groups generally is reserved for organic molecules. Okay, so for metal ions, we just say it's a metal cofactor. Okay, we don't really call them a prosthetic group because they're not, they're just too small for that. Okay, but they work the same way. They are, they are structural part of the enzyme. You can't, they can't leave the enzyme without breaking it up completely. Okay. Ubiquinone is a co-substrate, similar to NADH, for example, okay? So it comes to the reaction, takes some electrons, and goes away and puts them somewhere else. It's, it's not a structural part of any enzyme. 
in mitochondria in the respiratory chain, but we'll cover that in two days' time. So don't worry about the specifics now, okay, because we'll see it again and we'll talk about these again. All right. Some oxidoreductases, some oxidoreductases do more things than just reduction and oxidation. So we do have enzymes that are part of the EC1 class of oxidoreductases, but they do more than just one thing. So usually they oxidize, for example, something, and at the same time, they cause a decarboxylation. Or they oxidize, and at the same time, they cause deamination. So they combine two enzyme activities in one, okay? Not two enzyme activities, but two actions, two chemical actions, really, in one go, basically. And these are much more complex enzymes, and we'll mention one of them, uh, one of them today in this lecture, but under different heading, okay? Just be aware that we can have oxidoreductases that do more complicated things than just oxidation and reduction. Good. Uh, we can move on to the next class of enzymes or different type of reaction. I'm going to have to use this wet uh, sponge, so you might not be able to see much. So the next reaction that I want to talk about, again, very commonly found in metabolism, is dehydration. Yeah, dehydration. I know you can't see it, but dehydration. It will, it will come up as it dries, okay? Dehydration. Uh, Dehydration usually means that we start with a compound with an alcohol group, with an OH group. I'm trying to draw it here when it's, where it's dry. Whatever, something like this, okay? And we take this hydroxyl with this one hydrogen away as water, and we form a double bond. Do you see what happened there? This OH plus this one hydrogen went away as water, and what we're left with is a double bond. This is not a redox reaction. There is no oxidation or reduction. Okay, may not be obvious. Maybe it is obvious, I don't know. Uh, but it is not a redox reaction. No electrons are moved around, okay? We just take this oxygen and water, uh, sorry, oxygen and hydrogen, we make water, put it away, and it forms a double bond. So previously, when we were making double bond from a single bond, we had to take some electrons from it. There was a redox reaction. There was oxidation. This one is not oxidation. This one is dehydration. The enzymes that catalyze this reaction are part of the class of lyases. Uh, which is EC4. And lyases are a class of enzymes that break bonds. Okay? So in this class, EC4, all the enzymes are breaking some bonds. What bond are, are they breaking here? OH. Not OH, but not CC. Not CH, well, CH, I guess, but CO. CO, they're breaking this bond in this case, okay? This bond is broken, and we are left with the double bond here. So it's a type of lyase. There are many, many different types of lyases. Some of them are breaking CC bonds, some of them are breaking CN bonds, some of them are breaking CO bonds, etc. It's all this big class, and this is just one example, okay? So dehydratases catalyzing this reaction are part of lyases, are one subgroup of lyases. Okay, now this reaction, this dehydration, can relatively easily run in the opposite direction as well. So we can have dehydration and hydration as just by 
turning the, the same reaction around. Okay? We don't need another enzyme. So in this case, even if we had a hydratase, so this would be, in this way, the enzyme would be called a dehydratase. Okay? And if we turn the reaction around, we would call it a hydratase, because we'll be making an alcohol from a double bond. Okay? So this would be a hydratase. Sorry, hydratase. But it's still the same enzyme, it's still the same reaction. It would still be part of EC4 lyases. Okay? I know that this may sound a bit strange. We, we're going to call it a lyase, an enzyme that breaks a bond, even in the opposite direction when it's actually forming a bond. Okay? But it's just, I mean, the, we can't name the same enzyme by two different names and put it in two different classes. Okay? So it is a lyase because we name it by this direction, but it can, all, all, it can usually also catalyze the opposite direction, the direction in the opposite direction as well. Does that make sense? Huh? Well, obviously, yes, of course, yeah. Water needs to be added to it, yeah. Well, uh, with anabolic and catabolic, it's, if you just look at one reaction, that's pretty tricky. You can only tell if a, if a reaction or a set of reactions is anabolic and catabolic if you see the larger context, okay? One reaction, one specific reaction, can be part of an anabolic pathway or a catabolic pathway. You can't really tell from a reaction whether it's going to be catabolic or anabolic. <coughs> anabolic pathways are pathways where there's a sequence of reactions where we start with a complex organic molecule and we break it down to a simple molecule like carbon dioxide or something like that. Anabolic pathways are the opposite. Well, usually we don't start with carbon, carbon dioxide, but we start with something relatively simple and we build it up. But if you just cut out one reaction from a sequence, it's impossible to tell whether it's part of catabolic or anabolic pathway because you need the context. What, what is the, where, where do we start with, what did we start with, and what did we end with, okay? One reaction is, you, ca you can't tell whether it's catabolic or anabolic. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah? good. Yeah. Um, yes? We can't call it condensation because the amount of molecule in the reaction before, but also the molecule, in, like the, the water goes to another it's not a in the book. Yeah, it's definitely not condensation, okay, in this, in this case, because in condensation you're joining two molecules, okay? You're making a bond from two molecules by removing water, okay? Here you are sort of making a bond by removing water, but you're not really joining two things together. But we can uh, involve two molecules, but only one molecule is, have the lysis, have the break and the other molecule can get the water maybe because um, the electrons go somewhere. It's not there are no electrons involved. No electrons were harmed in this reaction. No electrons. This is not a redox reaction. No, no, no. Neither is condensation, okay? But neither of them is a redox reaction. There, there are no electrons moving places in either of them, okay? It's not a redox reaction. All right. Hydratases, dehydratases. We'll see one, one second, we'll see uh, one dehydratase, well, we'll see several hydratases and at least one dehydratase in our metabolic pathways. Usually they don't really need any special coenzymes, okay? Some dehydratases contain, contain zinc ions, okay? But not, not, not all of them, just some of them do. But there are no special coenzymes for hydratases and dehydratases. Yep. So Yep. Last right, but the hydrotase, which is the same enzyme, just different name, is uh, will belong to a different class. No, it, oh, it has to be the same one, oh, right? So it's it's the same enzyme. Okay, it's right? different name. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the reason why I'm talking about it is that in this direction, it's obvious why it's lyase, okay? Yeah. In the opposite direction, it's the same enzyme, it's still a lyase, but in the opposite direction, it looks a bit weird because you're not breaking any bonds. I mean, you could say that you're breaking the double bond, but yeah, not really but it's still the same enzyme, so you can't put it to a different class because it's just running in the opposite direction. It's still lyase, okay? Good. Uh, so no special coenzymes here. Uh, a typical sequence of reactions that we see quite often uh, in metabolism, and we'll see it in the Krebs cycle in two days time, or whenever we, we get to it, um, 
is a sequence of making a double bond from a single bond which is what kind of reaction? What, what, what is this reaction? It's oxidation. This is a redox reaction. Yeah, we're moving two electrons away. Yep. Now, what do you mean? This? Okay, this could be an elimination reaction and ad an addition from the other side. Yes. Okay, but I'm not sure that's helping, but, but if it's helping you, that's fine. That's great. Yes, it is. It is. That's what it is. Okay. So the sequence of reactions that we often find is oxidation. In the next reaction, we add some water. What is this reaction? It's hydration or addition, if you want. Okay, it's addition on the double bond or hydration in this specific case. We get an alcohol. And then we make this alcohol into an aldehyde or a ketone. And what is this last reaction? Oxidation. Okay? So this is not a redox reaction. There are no electrons taken away. Okay, we're just adding water to the double bond. That's all we're doing. A very common pattern, and we'll see it running this way or running that way in several different pathways. Two electrons, two E. Good. The next the next, and we'll take a short break in a second, but the next group of enzymes that I want to talk about are isomerases, and they are part of the EC5, or they are the EC5 class. Isomerases. And as the name suggests, these enzymes turn one isomer to a different isomer. However, as you know, there are many different kinds of isomerism. So do you know any isomerisms, any type of isomers that we have? Cistrans, geometric isomers. Epimers, which are optical isomers. Enantiomers, yeah. Huh? Anomers, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so positional isomers, when, for example, a function, functional group is in, on different atom in the molecule, okay? And for all these changes of these isomers, we have subgroups of isomerases, okay? So we have cis-trans isomerases, for example, okay? We have positional isomerases that take a, an, a functional group and move it around the molecule, okay? These are sometimes called mutases, but I, I will leave this mutase thing because it's a little confusing. We'll, we'll see it as a name, but it is a bit confusing because the official rules say that it should be something else, okay? We do have epimerases that turn one epimer to a different epimer, okay? So epimerases are enzymes that change the optical, the, the chiral center, they change it to the opposite configuration, okay? So these would be called epimerases. Epimerases, okay? change epimers, one epimer to another, by changing the, conf the spatial configuration on an asymmetric a chiral center in a molecule. So those would be epimerases, okay? Now, some epimerases are sometimes also called mutases, and that's why I said it's really confusing because they, mutases can mean several different types of enzymes. And the official rule is that if there is just one chiral center, center in a molecule, then the enzyme that changes the configuration is called a mutase. And if there's more than one chiral center, then it's called epimerase, okay? But don't worry about it. You will just basically learn the enzyme, what it's called. Okay, so don't worry about the rules. No, I will not repeat it because not, it's not that important, okay? It really isn't important, okay? So don't, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, good. 
I'll leave the first part here. Let's take a very short break, three minute break, and we will continue. All right. I know that I know the break was quite short, but we need to carry on. So I will carry on even if you're talking, okay? And just have a look at the video if you can't hear me. All right, uh, the next group of reactions that I want to talk about is decarboxylation. Huh? It's all four isomers, okay? No more. We will see them in specific reactions, but for today, this is all. Decarboxylation is a very, very common reaction that we see a lot in, um, uh, in various metabolic pathways. And uh, decarboxylases are part of the lyases group, so EC4 again. So they are breaking down a CC bond because they are decarboxylating. They are removing a carboxyl group, usually producing carbon dioxide, which is then released. Um, and again, it's a very, very common reaction that we see. Basically, we have carboxyl group somewhere in the molecule and it gets turned to carbon dioxide and to some remaining compound then depending on what specific compound it is. So it's a very simple thing. Now, we do have, uh, with, with decarboxylation and with decarboxylases, we usually find associated two coenzymes, okay? It's not always the case, but many of them do, and if you remember that, you will probably say it correctly in most situations. Uh, one coenzyme, which is very often uh, found in decarboxylases of oxoacids, or ketoacids, oxo acid decarboxylation is called thiamine diphosphate. Or sometimes you see it as thiamine pyrophosphate. It's the same thing. So TDP or TPP is the same thing. Okay? Thiamine diphosphate or thiamine pyrophosphate is the same thing. Okay, so this is a coenzyme of decarboxylases, especially decarboxylases that decarboxylate oxo acids. Now with oxo acids, we will see them a lot in metabolism, lots of oxo acids in metabolism, okay? And we'll see two types of oxo acids most commonly. We will see alpha oxo acids and we'll see beta oxo acids, so this is alpha oxo acid and we'll see beta oxo acids, as you would expect. Okay, alpha oxo acids and beta oxo acids. Now their decarboxylation, even though you would say, well, it's the same thing, their decarboxylation is quite distinct. With beta oxo acids, this decarboxylation, when it happens, is, it can be completely spontaneous. It might not even need an enzyme, it just happens, okay? Sometimes we do use enzymes, but it, it's a relatively spontaneous thing. For alpha oxo acids, and again, something that we'll see very, very shortly, uh, we do need quite complex enzymes and complex mechanisms for this to decarboxylate, okay? And for these, especially for the alpha oxo acids, the first coenzyme which is present in these kind of decarboxylases is usually thiamine diphosphate, okay? But this is not enough for alpha oxo, acid, alpha oxo acids. For alpha oxo acids, it's usually thiamine diphosphate. But it's usually not enough. And in addition to this decarboxylation, we also have to, or what happens in our metabolism often is that at the same time that we decarboxylate them, we also oxidize them. So it's called oxidative decarboxylation. It's a combination of oxidation and decarboxylation. 
we will see a few enzymes in metabolism, which are these oxidative decarboxylases of alpha oxo acids. We'll see several of them. They are very important for metabolism. And they are very complicated enzymes because they contain five different coenzymes. We'll talk about them when we get there. Okay, this is just the first you know, introduction to these alpha oxo acid decarboxylases. They always contain thiamine diphosphate, so that's the first coenzyme that does the reaction. But then there are some other coenzymes which are needed for the oxidative part of this oxidative decarboxylation. So, you know, we have decarboxylations, but then we have oxidative decarboxylation, which is special. The other coenzyme, which is quite commonly found in decarboxylations, is pyridoxal phosphate. Abbreviated as PLP, pyridoxal phosphate. Pyridoxal phosphate. It's another coenzyme of decarboxylases, not for alpha oxo acids, but this time, pyridoxal phosphate is very common for decarboxylases of amino acids, so alpha amino acids. Yeah? If we are decarboxylating amino acids, usually we have pyridoxal phosphate then as a coenzyme. Okay, and we haven't even started yet. Okay. Uh, huh? Yeah, those are the normal amino acids that we, that we have. Okay, so just remember all amino acids. That's what they are. Uh, now, how do these coenzymes help us here? Because as I said, chemically speaking, these decarboxylations can be tricky. It's not an easy thing to do, chemically speaking. So that's why we use these coenzymes to help us. And I will just show you very briefly how these coenzymes actually do it. So thiamine diphosphate has a very peculiar structure inside the molecule. I would just draw a part of the molecule, not the whole thing. And in the structure, we see a ring You know the ring? What is it called? Huh? I tell you. Okay. If you look it up, that's fine. It's called thiazol. Thiazol ring. The, I'm starting to see that you're very excited and worry about very complicated things that we'll never really use for anything. Okay? Like thiazol. Uh, and maybe not enough about the things that we'll see many, many, many times again, okay? But anyway, uh, this is just an illustration why thiazole is such an interesting thing. In this thiazole ring, you can see there's a carbon atom which is neighbored by a sulfur atom and a positively charged nitrogen. Both of these elements are more electronegative than carbon, okay? And what it means for the carbon is that they are pulling electrons away from the carbon, yeah? I mean, this carbon has normally one hydrogen bound to it, but as these electrons are being pulled away, the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen becomes really weak. And the hydrogen goes away as a proton, and we are left with, very unusually, with a negatively charged carbon. This state of carbon is called carbon ion. Okay, it's an anion from carbon, carbon ion. And it's extremely reactive, and it really likes anything which is positively charged, or at least a little bit positively charged. And as luck would have it, this alpha carbon in an alpha oxo acid is, has a slight positive charge, usually denoted as this delta plus, a slight positive charge, because this oxygen is also pulling electrons towards it. So there are fewer electrons here, so it's a little bit positively charged. And this negatively charged carbon in thiamine pyrophosphate jumps in, attacks this carbon, and allows the, the decarboxylation to carry on. Okay? So we're really, with thiamine diphosphate, we're use, using really exotic chemistry with this carbon ion, with this negatively charged carbon, very unusual, okay? Um, in order to help us with, with the reaction, which otherwise would be very difficult to perform. 
Now, thiamine pyrophosphate with this interesting structure is not only in decarboxylases of alpha oxoacids, we'll also see it in some other places, okay? But this is your first example of thiamine diphosphate as a cofactor. Pyridoxal phosphate is doing a similar thing for us, but this time for amino acids. How, is it, how does it do it? Well, pyridoxal phosphate contains in its structure an aldehyde group bound to some pyridine uh, ring. But it's about the aldehyde. Because this aldehyde is quite reactive and will react with an amino group quite happily Okay. So. so this is pyridoxal phosphate having reacted, having performed condensation in this case. This is condensation, okay. And forms this structure, this imine, okay. It's an imine, it's not an amine, but an imine because there's a double bond there. You've heard of imines before? Okay, it's an imine. Don't worry about imines, that's not important. The important thing is that this whole structure where we have some aromatic ring and an imine is called a shift base. So to recap, what pyridoxal phosphate does in the enzyme as a coenzyme, it attacks the amino group of the amino acid. binds to it to form a shift base, which by some electron transformation here, destabilizes this carboxyl group so that it can go away and be decarboxylated. Yes? With what? The what? The what? The what? Oh, with Hazel, okay. What about it? Hmm? This is a part of the coenzyme called thiamine diphosphate. It's just a part of it, the interesting part. Thiamine diphosphate is a coenzyme, for example, of alpha oxoacid decarboxylases, but also of, of other enzymes. And this is just the chemically interesting part of the whole molecule. It's a bit more complicated as a molecule itself. Okay, for now, if you just remember it's thiamine diphosphate and it has something to do with decarboxylation of alpha oxoacid, that's all that is needed at this point. Okay, we'll see it again in action. So this formation of a shift base then destabilizes this carboxyl group which can then leave and helps the decarboxylation of amino acids. In fact, one second, in fact, as a rule of thumb, if there's a reaction which involves an amino acid, well, apart from making proteins, obviously, but otherwise, if you don't know what the coenzyme is and you say pyridoxal phosphate, it's probably gonna be right, okay? Not 100%, but most reactions with amino acids do use pyridoxal phosphate because it's handy to form this shift base and then you can do stuff to it, okay? Yep. Uh, the decarboxylation is not easily reversible, no, because, uh, like, we'll, actually in a second we'll come to carboxylation, which is the opposite, but it, you can't easily reverse it. And one reason why you can't reverse it is that this carbon dioxide just goes away and, and you don't have it anymore. Uh, there are other reasons why it's difficult to reverse, but generally decarboxylations are not easily reversible now. Yeah. Yeah, so. Pyridoxal phosphate contains an aldehyde group, which is quite reactive and likes to react with amino groups. If an amino acid gets into the active site of the enzyme, this aldehyde will react with the amino group of the amino acid and form what is called a shift base, which is this imine structure, okay? In the case of decarboxylases, it destabilizes this, this carboxyl group, it, it can go away as a, as a carbon dioxide and we decarboxylate the amino acid. We'll see in a second that we can use this mechanism also for other reactions. Shift base is the product? Yeah, this, this whole thing is called a shift base. 
Okay. Generally, in organic chemistry and synthetic, synthetic chemistry, a shift base is an imine formed from an aromatic compound. But you know, just be aware that it, this reaction forms shift base. Good. Uh, the opposite reaction to decarboxylation is a carboxylation. But unlike for hydration and dehydration, where we just said it's very easy to reverse it, it can run in both directions just depending on the ratios or conditions, here we can't easily reverse it. So a carboxylation is a completely different reaction to decarboxylation. And we also have a different class of enzymes that carboxylate things, which is distinct from these decarboxylases. They're not the same enzymes. Okay. So uh, carboxylases are part of EC3. EC3, which are ligases. And ligases are enzymes that connect atoms, that form new bonds, okay? So lyases, like decarboxylases, break bonds. Ligases, I know it sounds almost the same, but ligases connect atoms and form new bonds. So carboxylases are part of ligases. Now for carboxylation, so while decarboxylation for decarboxylation, you just need to move things around and the carbon dioxide just goes away. It's relative, it's thermodynamically speaking, it's a relatively favorable reaction, although sometimes you have to do a bit of tricks. For carboxylation, it is generally very unfavorable. And we usually, in most carboxylations in our organism, we need to add ATP, we need to add some free energy for it to run, okay? So if you remember when we talked about thermodynamics, we said that reactions generally run towards equilibrium as, as Gibbs energy decreases. For carboxylation, we're basically running in the opposite direction. We're, go, we're running uphill. So we need to add ATP, we need to hydrolyze ATP, which allows the Gibbs energy to decrease sufficiently so that the whole thing, uh, so the whole thing actually occurs. Okay? So we're coupling two reactions together. One is hydrolysis of ATP, which is very favorable. The other one is adding carbon dioxide to a molecule, which is very unfavorable. But overall, it is favorable because the, the hydrolysis of ATP is giving us more, de bigger decrease in, in Gibbs energy. Okay? This happens very often in metabolism, where we couple reactions, a very unfavor unfavorable reaction, with a very favorable reaction so that we can perform them. Okay? So here, one second. Here, we add ATP almost always in order to carboxylate something. Yes? It's not EC6 It's EC3. They're ligases. Yeah, but on the, on the Is it wrong? On no? On slides, yeah. Those are not my slides. OK, EC3, ligases. Slides of this one. Yeah, OK. From this one, it's well, six. E Okay, I think it's EC3, but you can easily look it up, okay? It's the, the classes of enzymes, you can find them anywhere on the internet, okay? It's, it's the official classification. So I, I think it's EC3, but you'll find it. There are ligases. Ligases, all right? Now, a very common coenzyme of, lig of uh, carboxylases is biotin. So most carboxylases, as enzymes that add carbon dioxide, that add carboxyl groups, will contain biotin as a coenzyme, okay? Not all of them do, but most of them do, okay? So it's a, it's a, you can easily connect it. If there's a carboxylation, there's probably gonna be biotin. Again, it's not 100%, but it's pretty common. All right, so those are carboxylases a distinct class of enzymes from decarboxylases. And the, next, and the next group of enzymes that are reaction and a group of enzymes that I want to talk about is transamination. Transamination. What is a transamination? Uh, 
Yeah, it's not quite substitution between an amine ketone. Rather, it's a transfer of amino group between an amino acid, usually, or an amino compound, and an oxo compound. Okay? Substitution is a, little, is a word that in chemistry means something a little bit different. Okay? Uh, but anyway, transamination is the usual mechanism or the usual type of transamination that we find many, many times in metabolism is that we start with an amino acid plus an oxo acid. So this would be R1, R2, and an oxo acid. And we flip the amino, so we take this amino group and we put it here and we make an amino acid. And this former amino acid becomes an oxo acid. Like so. So this is transamination. And it can easily, in most, in most circumstances, it can easily run in both directions. Okay, so this transamination is, can work either way. Obviously, because you just kind of flip things around, okay? So it's between carbonyl, not just a ketone? It's, it's from a carbonyl group. It could be an aldehyde as well, okay? And we'll see some aldehydes that undergo transamination as well. Okay? Now, the coenzyme for transaminases, or actually, so they're called, the enzymes are called transaminases, or sometimes, in, especially in English literature, they're called aminotransferases. And they are part of the transferase group, which hopefully is EC2. Transferases. Transfer. Transferases. And transferases are just enzymes that take one group from, from one molecule and move it to another molecule. Okay, that's transferase. So here we are taking an amino group and we're putting it onto another molecule. That's what they do. These aminotransferases or transaminases contain almost, without exception, contain as their coenzyme pyridoxal phosphate. How does it work? Well, pyridoxal phosphate comes to an amino acid, forms a shift base, and here for a decarboxylase, we saw that it destabilized this carboxyl group and it just went away. In a transaminase, this doesn't happen. In a transaminase, this shift base is first hydrolyzed, so water molecule comes in, and breaks this bond. What happens? Well, from this carbon, we get an oxo acid. And the amino group is retained by the pyridoxal phosphate, which is hidden in the active site of the enzyme. Then in the next step, an oxo acid comes in. The former pyridoxal phosphate, in this case it's pyridoxamine phosphate, will react with the oxo group, will form another shift base, and then water comes here and breaks this bond, and we get an amino acid which leaves the enzyme. So it's a two-step, it's so-called ping-pong mechanism. First, we take an amino, group, amino acid. The amino group is retained by the enzyme, by the coenzyme, by pyridoxal phosphate in the enzyme. And then we take an oxo group and put the, the amino group, which was retained on the pyridoxal phosphate, back to the uh, oxo acid and form an amino acid. So this is the mechanism of all transaminases, and they use pyridoxal phosphate for that, thanks to this shift base thing. Is the name of the coenzyme? Pyridoxal phosphate, as before. It's the same thing. So he, he does both? Like a de, a cal, a no, a decarboxylase will decarboxylate an amino acid and will contain pyridoxal phosphate. But if the pyridoxal phosphate is in transaminase, then it's not going to decarboxylate, it's going to transaminate. Yeah, it is. Pyridoxal will say. Yes? Are we doing this in more detail later or is it just for context? Both. <laughs> yes. 
This is for context, but we will use this information. So I'm not gonna, I'm not going to draw this again. We already saw it, okay? But we'll see it in specific examples later on in metabolism. Can you say like again, you first the one and then what? The, like how it works, No, <laughs> but it's recorded. You can have a look at it in the recording, okay? It would take too much time to go through it again, okay? Uh, but you, you can have a look at it later on. All right, uh, the next r reaction uh, that I want to talk about is esterification, so forming of esters. We'll see quite a few reactions where esters are formed, uh, and more specifically, we will see quite a lot of reactions where thioesters are formed. So what are esters? Hmm? You have to speak up. Okay, so it's an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. It doesn't have to be primary, but okay. So we have an alcohol and a carboxylic acid and we form an ester, okay? Typically, for example, if we were making fats, if we are making triacylglycerols or something. It is a product of condensation, correct. Okay, so it is a condensation reaction. Um, for thioesters, we are reacting a carboxylic acid with a thiol alcohol, with a thiol. So instead of OH group, we are re reacting it with an SH group. And this specifically occurs if we are forming esters of coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is a very complex molecule which at the end has an SH group, a thiol. And coenzyme A is a carrier, is a universal, pretty much universal carrier of carboxylic acids, fatty acids, and other types of acids in metabolism. So usually if we want to metabolize an acid like acetate or longer fatty acids, we first have to make this thioester with coenzyme A, which then carries it through all the different steps. Okay, so this is a special type of esterification where we are making a thioester. And for making thioesters, even for making esters actually, we need to add some energy, some free energy. So this is not a thermodynamically spontaneous process. Okay, whether we're making esters or thioesters, we need to bring some energy. So esterification, making esters or thioesters. Uh, these enzymes that make esters or thioesters are also part of the EC2 transferases class because they're taking some group and putting it to another molecule, okay? So they're also EC2 transferases. But here specifically, we are making esters. If we already have an ester and we want to break it down, again, a very common reaction in metabolism, we are going to use a hydrolase. So we are breaking down an ester by hydrolysis, by adding a molecule of water, and we're going to have a group of or class of enzymes called hydrolases. Sorry? what? Ester esterification is transferases. I mean, e enzymes that make esters would be part of transferases. Okay, not sure what's unclear, but anyway, but hydrolases are a distinct class, okay? Here I have EC3, so you are probably right that it couldn't have been EC3. What was it before that we had? Ligases? I'm actually yeah, there are six. Yep. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay? Esterases are breaking down esters, they're not making esters. Transferases are making esters. So esterification is a different thing than deesterification. So once again, if we are making esters, we're going to use a transferase, and we probably need to add ATP to it. 
if we are breaking down an ester, we need a hydrolase because it's a hydrolysis, which is a distinct class. Hmm? Yes, these would be called esterases, for example. Okay, so esterase is not an enzyme that makes an ester. Esterase is an enzyme that breaks down an ester. An esterase is an enzyme that breaks down the ester bond. Okay? The one that makes it, that creates the bond, is part of transferases and it will have different names. Okay? It will have different names. Usually it's called a transferase, but it can have a different name as well. Yes. And it's part of hydrolase class. Okay? All right. I'm already starting to see that it's a little bit too much, yeah? Shh. Say again? We definitely can, but not in our metabolism. We can do it in a lab, in a test tube, but that's not what happens in metabolism. No. So the enzymes that make esters, okay, and this is unfortunately the last time that I will repeat it, okay, because we still have other things that I need to go through. Those that make esters are called transferases. Those that break down esters are called esterases, and they are part of hydrolases. Okay? Good. Uh, there are a few reactions that I'll leave out because I need to get to something else. And that is that most of the coenzymes that we just mentioned are derived from vitamins. Okay? So many of the, uh, of the coenzymes that we just mentioned are derived from vitamins, and most of them are derived from vitamins from the group B, so the water-soluble vitamins. Vitamin B1, yeah. called thiamine, indeed, <laughs> is, gives us which cofactor? Thiamine diphosphate, perfect. Which we find in what kind of enzymes, for example? Yeah, for example, in decarboxylases, in, in alpha oxoacid decarboxylases. Excellent. Yeah, there are other ones as well. Okay. B2 is called riboflavin. And indeed, it gives us all the flavin coenzymes. So FAD or FMN. Flavin coenzymes, they're called flavin because they are yellow. It comes from Latin for yellow. They're all very yellow, okay? And uh, hence the name. So flavin coenzymes. Now the next B3, I really don't like these, these numbers, they're just confusing, is nicotinamide. 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 And, okay, give me the three minutes before we end, okay, and then we can have a discussion. Nicotinamide obviously is the starting substance for NAD plus and NADP plus, as you would expect, okay? Then we have another B vitamin called pantothenic acid. I think it's B5 or something like that. Pantothenic acid, which is part of coenzyme A, indeed. Then B6, pyridoxin, gives us pyridoxal phosphate. Needs to be metabolized a little bit, but in the end we get pyridoxal phosphate. Then, well, I'm not gonna call it that, but <laughs> The next coenzyme, which we haven't really covered in these reactions, because we would have too many, is folic acid, which gives us a coenzyme called tetrahydrofolate. And tetrahydrofolate is a coenzyme which is super important. 
which is super important for transferring one carbon units. And we will see them in several reactions where we have to take a single carbon and put it somewhere else, usually making a methyl group or moving a methyl group around. And tetrahydrofolate is a very important coenzyme for that. So there's a, these are, again, transferases, which transfer single carbon units, okay? And we, we will see it later on. The last out of this row of B vitamins, which is a source of coenzymes B12, or cobalamin, the coenzyme which is formed from cobalamin is adenosylcobalamin, and there are some di different ones. And cobalamin is also a coenzyme which is needed for one carbon group moving around, okay? There are only two enzymes in our metabolism which contain cobalamin, but they are super important, and we will hear about both of, both of them once we go through the metabolic pathways. So, these B vitamins are the basis of many of the coenzymes. We do have also coenzymes which are not formed from B, B, B vitamins, for example, with vitamin K is also a coenzyme for a special subgroup of enzymes, okay? But we will cover that once, once we get there, okay? All right, any questions? These are all coenzymes, okay? Or vitamins, vitamins, and then they form coenzymes, okay? Some of them are co-substrates, some of them are prosthetic groups, yeah. All right.